So it looks like I'm alive. I'm hoping the sound is okay. Um, looks like there's two people here, at least according to the screen I'm looking at. I was like sitting here, said I was live and the screen was black and I realized I had my little uh, cam shutter still on my camera. I'll put it back on after. I just kind of flicked it off quickly. Okay, this seems to be kind of, let's get the light in here a little bit more accurately. So here's the Hellboy I started last week. This week has been so busy. I ran a ton of errands that I had to run, couldn't, couldn't avoid them. Uh, I had a bunch of layouts I had to do, had some covers I have to do. And it just meant I, I only got about 85, 90% of the way through the Hellboy. But I figured I'd show it to you guys. Hey, Anzen, happy you're here. Um, so I'm still going to be, I'm going to be doing some uh, rubber stamp effects so I can get in like a, cause it, it's a cave. It's going to be a dark, dark place. Uh, so I can um, get a nice gray tone over everything and then pull out some highlights. And um, so that's, that's what I'm going to do. There's uh, like, there's certain things here. I went too far in and even though I want that kind of like Mignola slope shouldered look on Hellboy. Uh, I can't quite pull it off the same way he can. So um, I'll be doing things like pulling out a rim light on his shoulder here. Do it now while we're on my camera. Outside of his... It'll just make him separate more from the background. Because uh, right now he looks like a dark shape. And, and, and anyone who's done any black and white photography knows that red shows up in, as near black. Uh, in black and white. So since this is never going to be colored, um, I got to I got to take that into account. I mean, I, I guess I could have cheated. I could have just drawn them and add a little bit more shadows on them. But this feels right. Um, so stuff still to be done is there's a whole bunch of values. I got to I got to darken down here. I want to be able to get the crown that's here in the water a little darker so I can pull the highlights out of it so it'll work. And then um, by using my rubber stamps here, I can I can have like the black of like looking through the water into the shadows, uh, mid-tone, and then a highlight on the water, which is much more accurate to what water would look like. Uh, I got my pearls. I got another another clam and more pearls here, 30th anniversary, pearl anniversary. Um, I got to do the ocean and then the, water, the waves kind of splashing in here into the cave. Uh, I have some reference for what happens when, when it splashes and starts settling into the cave. It's a little more wild. Uh, and then, of course, I got to render up uh, the top of the cave. Um, and I might, I might actually use some rubber stamp to imply the horizon and then the clouds in the cave. So that 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 would get it done. I'll probably do a sticker and, and sign here in this nice nice little corner here at the bottom. Um, but yeah, it's mostly done. I'll probably I have some other pressing deadlines, so I probably won't get to finish it until Tuesday. But uh, I probably would have finished it if I didn't start this week's piece, uh, which is the storm piece. Uh, so I drew storm, very reminiscent of uh, what Paul Smith did. Um, uh, I like a, a slightly curvier storm because that, that feels more like what uh, Byrne and Cochran were doing with her uh, before the Smith. Smith made her like so lean. Um, which was, I mean, I, I love Smith's ability to do that, but I felt Storm should be a little, a little bit more curvy uh, just to give her a different body shape than some of the other, uh, like Phoenix, I felt, would have had that that Storm, Paul Smith Storm body shape. Uh, and Storm would be a little bit more, um, slightly wider hips. Um, so that's, 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 that's what I'm going with Storm. I knew the special effect I want to do here, so I, I found one of the storm logos i'm gonna i'm gonna be doing some stuff on top of that uh so i dropped it in in a black area and some indication in the black area what i'm going to do with their lightning effect here so hopefully that'll 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 come off nice it'll basically be her in her in her black punk suit uh wearing some doc martens 
and uh, her black glove and her fingers. But but since it's going to be a lightning effect coming here, I have to be mindful of um, the way lightning works. And then um, I might actually have some lightning hitting hitting her logo. That might be too much. I'll, I'll have to think about it as I go. So that's what I'm going to be working on tonight. Oh my God, you can hear my throat's already going. I just don't talk during the day. I just draw all day. Unless I have a meeting or something, and then, then my throat gives out immediately. Uh, so that's that's what I'm going to be working on today. Um, as the tradition I'm trying to build here is every week I'm going to talk about some books I got. Um, one of the things I did is there's a, a store up here in Canada called The Labyrinth. They're mostly, you know, they're almost entirely online now. They used to have two brick and mortar stores. They specialized, <clears throat> they specialized, let me drink something here. Uh, they specialized, still like better. They specialized, I'm just going to talk through it. They specialized in uh, art books of all sorts. Um, concept art, uh, video game art, anime, manga, um, uh, BD imported from Europe, um, sketchbooks, all sorts of stuff like that. And uh, I first used to see them at conventions. It set up at conventions, mostly here in Canada, and they have this big book sale. And then they, they opened up ultimately two different brick and mortar stores and COVID kind of killed that. Um, but they, they, they still do these shows. They travel to conventions. They come back to that, but they're at Sheridan college in Oakville this week. So after getting the Kim Jong-gi book uh, mail order from them, I just, I, I, I saw a notification that they were opening up at Sheridan for the book show last week. So I drove down to Oakville and I bought a pile of books. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to show them all tonight because that would be like an hour just talking there. Uh, so I'm going to show one of the ones I got. I've been meaning to get this for quite some time. Let me move the camera down so you can actually get a good view on this one. Yeah, I, the whole punk history, I mean, um, the fact she had no connection with the punk movement in Africa. And, and like punk is still out. They're still punk bands, but they're not the same. But anyway. So um, that's a better way to get this up on camera without it being completely, here we go. Here we go, that'll work. I'll stick it on a roll of tape. So I finally got this Franklin Booth um, book. Let me get the, some of that glare off. There we go, that works. Um, if you love Bernie Wrightson, you probably know who Franklin Booth is. And I had seen a ton of Franklin Booth in uh, reference in other artists' books. Uh, primarily Bur uh, Bernie Wrightson books um, and uh, online. I was familiar with a handful of pieces that were very, very close to what Bernie Wrightson was doing. I was not prepared for the full range of, of technique and style and composition that this guy brought to the table. I mean, um, you can see... Yeah, I mean, you can see the rights in here and these trees and everything, little farmstead. But, oh, my gosh. I mean, uh, just wait till we start seeing some period stuff, uh, some photos, some biography, which I'm sure is important. But, I mean, look at this. Holy crap. Just that almost like ghostly drawing of a city and how dark he goes in this wonderful, uh, wonderful work. And if you're, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to do some studies of this just to get it because I, I when I was younger I, I used to play around with trying to copy what uh, Bernie was doing. So, so I think that might be better. Do that just also to get rid of glare. It makes it a lot darker, but better that than the glare. I think. I mean, this book, um, his drawings are and his influences, but his drawings are also amazing. Um, let me, let me, let me jump in a bit so we can actually get to some of the stuff, uh, that really wowed me. I mean, these little spot drawings, these people in a cemetery, uh, over here, just these beautiful, beautiful, I'm not sure what's, they don't, sadly, they don't list how so, the size of these, but the level of mastery and the different ink techniques that I've never seen Wrightson use. 
And it could be that Wrightson never got to see some of these pieces because this is a very recent book. And I don't know if there was ever a complete Franklin Booth book before this. I know, again, oh my God, look at this. Oh my God. Uh, this Indian tiger hunt. I mean, you can see the stuff that, that Wrightson lifted, but this elephant's amazing. Just, just the angle on the elephant, like go, doing a shot from behind the ear and the ear's flaring out. Yeah, another little elephant over here in the tall grass. Then the tiger, like right in there. Oh my God. And you see stuff like this where, where it starts overlapping with, I, I think I've, um, Joseph Clement Call, I've shown before, one of probably the biggest ink influence on me, more so than Wrightson. Um, there's, in work like this, there's like this merger between what I love about Joseph Call and, and what Booth does. I mean, oh my God. I mean, I wish I wish you guys all could get a copy of this because the level of dark that's all line work here is incredible. And I think I think some of these are reproduced from the printed books and not the originals because they actually have the type on it. Unless he had uh, he drew on uh, pieces of uh, large pieces of art with the type on it already. I don't know how you do that. Uh, with the technology they had then. These golf drawings, these trees. I mean, he had this sense of scale again and again. Like, oh my God, look at these. There's two women in this massive, like this redwood forest or something. It's incredible. Let me jump a little bit further in. And it's got such a broad range of work. I think a lot of this stuff was advertising work. Um, Look at this GE piece. I mean, what he did with the GE logo and he got the ink lines working amazing. So much stuff to learn from that I've never seen before. I'm 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 completely enamored. I've been flipping through this book pretty much for about an hour every day. Cause I can't, it, it's too much. It's it's too good. Oh my god, the Grim Reaper in his war shot. Oh my god. It's just just so masterful. I'm I'm in awe of this man's ability, and I was in awe of, abil of ability from what I'd seen previously. And there's just so much more of it. Oh. yeah. So I think it's around uh, seventy Canadian, maybe fifty U.S. Um, they just passed a couple of pictures I had seen before. I mean, these interior environments. Oh my God. I wish I had seen this as a younger man. It would have influenced me so much. These, oh, this Poe. I just love this Poe. Um, drawn in 1938. I have to check to see if it's if it's in public domain or, or still in copyright. Might be in the indicia in the book. Um, here's some of his, like that's, that's a reproductions from original drawings. So I don't know. Oh, charcoal, studying charcoal. Here he is in charcoal. Look at that charcoal study. Just gets all the values. So before he does it in ink, I guess. Seascapes. This forest shot here. Oh my God. Yeah, this is. Um, I can't. I'm. Um, I mean, I picked up a, another Kim Jong Gi book. Look at this charcoal drawing. Oh my God. It must be on like vellum or something because of the. The shading in it. I got another Kim Jong Gi book, which I'll show next week. But this is the book that is like literally eating my brain this week. I I I, I think this has been out for a couple of years now. It was on my wish list on Amazon, and I just kept not not grabbing it. And then I saw it in person at the um, Labyrinth Bookshelf at Sheridan, and I just had to grab it because as soon as I looked at it, I was like, oh my god. So if you love pen and ink. I, I highly recommend you add this to your collection. It's amazing. It's amazing. Uh, another thing I got. Uh, so this is this is me blowing my horn. Um, new cover uh, I drew. These are old covers for <clears throat> Ahoy's uh, Deadweight series. So I'll, I'll share these every month as they come out, but. Uh, the thing is, is I did them so they all they'll it's a it's a it's a lineup so you'll see that all the all the villains in this series are, are all standing in in a police lineup. So it was really fun to try and make just these headshots 
um, as interesting, as colorful as possible. Uh, in hindsight, I'm thinking, looking at now, I probably should have pulled out highlights a little bit more. Just, it, it looks so bright in the computer screen. I was worried to have like big white highlights, but you learn as you go. But I think this, I think, I think the, the multi-light idea of getting the shadows replicated uh, worked. So I'm pretty happy with this cover. The series itself, I, I got to read some of it. Uh, when I did the covers, I didn't get to see much of it. But the first two issues, uh, lots of fun stuff in it. Um, there's a little preview of the next issue cover. Um, yeah, I'm uh, pretty happy with that cover. So that's the other thing. And the third thing I'm going to show you before I start getting to work and talk maybe a little bit less. My, my buddy, Joseph Schmalke, he does horror comics. He does a real, talking about a punk sensibility. Um, he's got this really almost underground, um, really dark immediacy in his work. And this is, he just, he did a Kickstarter. I backed it. This is the hardcover of the first six issues of his Viking horror book. And I think everyone here knows I love Viking horror. Uh, we don't kill spiders. It's really beautifully put together. Um, the one thing, and it's like, I, I might talk to Joseph about this. I feel his work looks better on a matter paper. So a high gloss paper, which is, you know, really, really high quality presentation. But I think his work, it, it coheres a little bit better on a slightly more matte paper. But it's still it's still beautiful. He's got this like really really kind of like uh, gutsy uh, indie style of drawing, and he's fearless. Uh, if you've seen uh, the Cherry Blackbird graphic novel, I mean, there's a scene where a demon bursts through a guy's butt. Um, so there's it, it's darkly funny and horror and gross and cool and fearless. So I'm happy, happy to support uh, my buddy Joseph here. Uh, I've done covers for him too. In fact, hang on. I think it should be in here in the back. He said he, he pre-printed it. So my, the cover I did for him as an alternate should be in here. Hang on. There's some really, I mean, these are all Joseph stuff, but there's um, a bunch of his, a bunch of his other friends did covers for it too. Paul Pelliche, Rich Whittle, Christian Debari. I love Christian's work. Another Christian cover. Jay Ferguson, Carlos Villas. Uh, looks like photo manip, Photoshop painting. Uh, he really played around with it. Fun stuff. Dan Quintana, a couple of variants. Ben Templesmith, my buddy Ben. Uh, store exclusive, I guess. All right, here's mine. So this, this is the cover I did for uh, his issue one. Um, I think he's going to get me to do a cover for the second arc. So I'm happy for that. John Gallagher. Um, more Joseph covers, some wraparounds, some of the initial covers. So yeah, so this arrived this week, and in the pack, there is a solid metal bookmark. So I, I, you can use it to keep your place in the book or to cut lines of coke. I'm pretty sure it's pretty versatile. Um, <laughs> that's terrible. I've never done coke. I've been around people who've done coke. I've never done coke, never wanted to. But the first thing I see when I see this, and it's metal, I go, oh, yeah, you can just, you know, just like in the movies, man. And in this, I haven't had a chance to look at it yet, because, again, this week has been a nightmare. Um, there's a little, um, I think this is a preview. Just it was, in, it was in the pack. So I think it's a preview for the next, um, the next arc. So it's just, just a few pages with a nice cardstock cover. And this paper is a little less shiny. Uh, this might have been like um, a smaller printer to do this. And I, again, I, the colors sit better on it. So, um, and just look at that. Like someone's wearing a, a mask of stitched human skin. I just love it. So cool. So yeah, I'm a big fan of uh, what Joseph does. And I think I think he's a big part of why. Um, in addition to the witches, I'm going to be doing. I'm going to put this in the in the comic here too. So I'll probably lose it. Who knows? I might do coke just just to break it in. Uh, no, I won't. But uh, yeah, I also got a big pile of other books uh, over the next. I got I got enough books for the next two three 
uh, streams. Um, okay, I did these lights back here in the yard so you can see what I'm actually doing. And I'm probably gonna start up here on her face and time allowing, I'll move down to the special effect of her hands. I think people will be interested in seeing that. Oh, this is cool. Um, so I generally draw a uh, pencil, everything. Like this was initially, I don't, do I have it? No, I think I threw it in the recycle this week. So I use 0.7 pencils, 0.7 light mechanical pencils to draw pretty much everything I do. I really like these Simu pencils, but I also like these old Pentels with the rubber grip here. Uh, I usually travel with these. These are my studio pencils because they're, they're plastic bodies. I, if they came out with a metal body, this thing would be amazing. But I love the really fat grip. I could draw forever with these. And buying leads is like, you know, you go to Staples, they have like a three pack of the 0.7s and that's the best deal you get. I don't know, for some reason, just in the wind this week, I looked on, on Amazon and I found this big fat box. Here we go. This big fat box. Something tells me the pencils I was talking about didn't show up. These are the pencils I was holding. Here we go. So this is the Sumo. The one I think is a little more fragile. I've already had one just shatter on me in my, my, my carry bag. And this is the Pentel. I was using this for years before I discovered the Sumo. These are a little bit more durable. I think I have like four or five of these in the packaging still. Uh, so these will last me for a good long time. And I bought a box of the erasers and they last me forever because I, I hardly use these, but it's good to have them. Uh, and the Sumo Grip. And I just love, I just love this fat grip on the Sumo. Uh, it allows me to, I, I never get hand cramps anymore. Like before I'd be drawing for like four or five hours. Cause that when I'm drawing, I really get into it. Uh, I draw for four hours. All of a sudden my hand be like, oh, you, you better stop. Uh, but the fat grip, I don't, I, I stop from hunger now or fatigue. But anyway, like I was saying, it's like you, you buy these tiny little three packs. Let's see if I can find one of them lying around. Oh, I got, I got, oh, here we go. It's hidden. So I buy a three pack of these, right? And it's a pain in the ass. I only have like, um, gosh, I think it only has 12 per. So you, you all this plastic and everything is such a waste. And it's like 12 and you get three, so it's 36. And I'll go through in the drawing session. I'll go for five or six leads, right? So that tells you how, how much I'm buying these. So on a whim, I looked on Amazon and I found a box, a big fat box of these. And each of them, there's 12 tubes in here. And each, each tube carries 30 LEDs. So this has just become, I think it was this slide up or is, there we go. So it actually just slides a little bit. So you can just slide the lead out of it. So I'm set for a few months here. And I think I'm just going to, buy these in this bulk from now on. So uh, I, I, I did the math and it's a huge savings over like buying the uh, smaller packages. And um, because all of them are coming in this cardboard box, cardboard's recyclable. Um, the other ones come in those blister packs, like they have like plastic mounted on cardboard with three of the little containers in it. I just feel that this is more environmental, even though each one of these comes with its own thing. I think that prevents breakage. But uh, this just feels like uh, slightly more environmental, but it'll keep me with uh, with leads and save me some money. So I'm very happy about that. So yeah, so that's my week. <laughs> um, let's get this over here. So let me put this in here. I'm going to focus on her face a lot. Okay, so uh, as I as I get serious about drawing and, and talking less, um, people should feel free to ask me any questions they want to ask. Um, if you have any questions. Looks like there's like four people here right now, which is great, and someone like this, so that's always a good feeling. Um... Start with the five, get those initial lines in. So yeah, so the outfit, uh, I did a little change here. Uh, I exposed the midriff. I, I was looking, there was, um, 
In fact, one of my friends um, pointed out to me because I, I announced this. I didn't show any the sketches. I just when I printed this, I went, "Oh, that's that's a good good thing for promoting the uh, the video." Uh, I I definitely pulled out some Paul Smith stuff just for his take on a costume, which is almost like a um, a solid black uh, suit with. Uh, I'm going to be doing Doc Martens on her because uh, it feels more punk uh, with some belts and not an exposed midriff. I'm giving her an exposed midriff because I figure she's going to have some piercing even giving her a belly button piercing. Uh, that feels a little bit more punk to me. Um, and giving her a tattered uh, crop top t-shirt, which also feels a little bit more punk than what she was wearing. Um, but I'm also going to uh, riffle up her hair. I know she had like completely straight white hair in uh, the early Cochrane Burn comics. And I think everyone up until recently maintained that straight white hair. Um, and what I saw when I was, when I was looking for some, uh, uh, looking for the Paul Smith stuff to reference, I saw a lot of newer designs where they actually put some of that, that body that black hair generally has so I, I really like that. I thought that was really attractive. So I'm going to be incorporating some of that. So it'll be a little straighter because there's, it's going up, but then it's going to be a little crinkly towards the end. So uh, so that's what I'm going with. I'm also going to give her black lipstick because I feel, that also feels more punk to me. I'm going to keep her weird eyebrows that she had from back then. Like those weird eyebrows that shoot straight up and out. I'm also going to do the same with the eyeliner she has. It's a little bit like uh, death from uh, Sandman. Extreme cat's eye type of look, just to keep it a little different. And tempted to give her a nose ring or at least like a, a stud in her nostril too, just to, to really go punk. Um, We'll make up a decision on that right off the bat. And as I'm looking here, it looks like I might have brought this eye up a little too high. Yeah, I did. I love it when I see mistakes right, right as I'm inking. Better, better then than after I've inked, honestly. Oh, hey, I had this thought. Uh, one of the ideas I have when I started doing these is I wanted to do um, instructional videos, like how, how to do certain things, how to draw certain things, how to ink certain things. I just did a little blob of ink there I'm going to have to get rid of. That's coming over there, so it's going to go like that. And it wraps up the head, so I don't get to see it. So there hasn't been much call. I did like one video, one of the ones that has really terrible sound um, about drawing heads. And it's there and it was strangely popular despite the sound of uh, me being a robot through the whole of it. So I'm, I'm tempted to do something a little more structured uh, and, and go through things like hands, heads, feet, some of the harder things to draw. Uh, is there interest or are there already enough people Uh, doing that on on YouTube that uh, you think it's sat that's a niche that's satisfied because I could either do that or I could do uh, a more in depth step by step thinking about making comics pages laying them out how I approach covers like that would be a little bit more nitty gritty and obviously it'd be a little bit more advanced um but I'd be willing to do the work for that. And I might, I don't know if it'd be live. I might have to drag a friend into, uh, get a friend who can edit. I got a friend who would uh, edit. I like I'd shoot everything and then we'd cut, sit down and cut it all down. So it'd be a lot more clear and concise. So I could do a series of videos on that. Okay, so Yanson, yeah, you'd be more interested in more of like the nitty gritty of approaching the final image and, and just assuming everyone approaching it has the drawing chops.
So that would probably end up being a series. Like I'll do a, a whole series on uh, storytelling and page design. And uh, so what I do is I like I do like one session on theory. And I'd be looking at a lot of different um, uh, pages or covers that I've done. Um, the resources, what I use along the way to understand and learn about it, what advice I've been given from different professionals over time. Um, I would bring in, uh, I'd probably also talk about other artists who lay out things differently than me. Because um, there's, there's certain approaches to design. I mean, there's there's people who, who who bring a level of energy, kineticism to their work that I can't touch. Um, I, I I I believe I'm a good storyteller. Um, I'm not the best action adventure storyteller. There was a time when I was doing superheroes, and much better at it, but my interests just quite aren't there anymore. Uh, I'm much more the type of storytelling that you would need for a good horror story. Um, I actually had problems with that in Conan. Uh, some of my choices were just wrong. I had to, I had to be, uh, uh, Jim was really helpful there. I had, to, I had to get my choices pushed back to be more of an action adventure type artist. Um, and I was really, really grateful for the hit. I, I just wasn't thinking that. It was really weird to uh, go, oh my God, I just, I've been into doing my own stuff for so long. It just, some of those decisions didn't occur to me. Because it's like with Second Coming, my priority for Second Coming is to make sure that the the jokes and the emotional moments land. And that requires a very different, to my mind, a very different approach to storytelling than your standard comic stuff. And... Um, so I take that job very, very seriously. So I think her hair would be behind the jacket. So I'm going to do there. How's that look? It's looking not too bad, I think. Is that a little out of focus or is that good? It also looks a little dark. Let's put some light in a little closer for this. There we go. That seems a lot brighter. That's better. Um, so I think I think there's a I think there's a lot of discussion to be had about storytelling, comics and comic creation in general. Uh, and I'd like to uh, to have that here. So uh, I like that Anson. I like that Anson's interested in the uh, storytelling layout composition for pages and covers. I could give her an eyebrow ring that would stand up nice and that's right right at that point. And I an eyebrow ring would be cool. That's almost too punk. I give her a Shazam earring. I think everyone can see that. Just put a little bit of shadow underneath that to make it pop a little bit better. All right. Well, in that case, I'm going to talk to my buddy who uh, asked about editing my uh, my my other off non-live videos, and uh, we'll see what kind of timeline schedule. Um, so I, I I'm also very interested in, uh, in in getting more creative content out there, so people can. Uh, especially, I, I think one of the benefits of it would be after I get some of them out. And people uh, see how I, I I think about this. I would probably love to get other people, uh, other professionals, to come on and talk about how they approach page design. Uh, have actually have a discussion, especially if they watch my video and say I'm full of shit. Yeah. Okay. There's something that feels a little. That's true. Absolutely true. Storytelling is. Storytelling is the point of comics. 
I mean, there's narrative illustration. I mean, every time someone, you know, thinks they're brilliant by doing a, a comic full of splash pages and all they are, are um, uh, just really big panels, which doesn't work for me. If you're, if um, I think, I think what sticks out is uh, John Byrne wrote and drew a 22 panel comic, but it was all splash pages. And he thought he was doing something revelatory, but it was it was it was sad because it was like, no, it was it was a twenty-two panel comic. He just drew everything really big. I think you could do twenty-two page, twenty-two full page illustrations. Um, I mean, full illustrations like every page would practically be. A, uh, uh, you'd have to have full narrative and action within each image. It could just be like that moment that you normally do like a close-up or something someone talking you would actually have narrative intent like in the classical book illustration sense for every page kind of like if if you've seen prince valiant right if you've seen prince valiant where uh prince valiant was largely single illustrations with text um you're, you're getting a sense of what, I, what I'm thinking that would have to be. I, I, I think it would be an interesting challenge to do a comic book. To my mind, it probably want to be a graphic novel. So then you do like 120 pages. Each page is a full page illustration. Uh, I think that could be fascinating. Um, I think uh, there's a lot of uh, approaches to comics that aren't really adaptable to a level of uh, experimentation if they're not doing the thinking that goes with it, the requirement of experimentation. I just realized I came across as really pompous. Um, how to explain that better. If you're gonna do something new with your medium, I think you have to really, really think about what you're doing. Um, and understand how it's going to affect the narrative. I, I kind of wish I probably have it in a box somewhere. I have that at Marvel fanfare issue of of the Hulk where where they they picked up because if as I remember correctly, John Byrne drew it. It was inked and and lettered, and then Jim Shooter saw it and rejected it because he thought it was like a waste of time because he, I mean, the whole comic was read in like five minutes. And uh, John Byrne had to go because he's legendarily fast. John Byrne went and drew a whole other issue. I think he just finished the next issue that he was going to draw anyway. And then Marvel Fanfare picked up because then they paid him anyway. Marvel Fanfare picked up uh, his Hulk issue and ran it so we could see it. And um, uh, I, I'm not one that necessarily agree with Jim Shooter. Um, I think he did a lot, a lot of damage to comics and comics creators uh, during his time in comics. But um, I think he made the right call there. It's it's uh, it's the difference between his interpersonal stuff and some of his creative choices. I remember uh, one time I had a friend who was uh, trying to write for his uh, what was it the um, I think it was his last independent company, Broadway Comics, because it was a division of Lauren Michaels' company. And the goal was to do um, comics that Lauren Michaels could theoretically turn into TV shows or movies. And uh, Jim Shooter. Yeah, um, sorry, I'm just popping over here. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, my God. Uh, so, so much stuff there. Uh, the David Maz, do you know about the artist edition that's coming out in a few months? I am so excited for that. So excited for that. And Prince Valiant was very much story, uh, storybook because they broke the text below it because it was very much an illustrated narrative. But I think Prince Valiant's closer to what I would want to see out of a comic book fully told in single panel uh, pages or splash pages. Our full page illustrations. Um, I'd want to see far more complex uh, interactions, environments, 
Uh, even if it's two people talking, I want to see get much more of a narrative sense of the space they're in. Um, action would have to be really, really thought through. Um, and, and this is what, kind of what I'm talking about. Whereas like when John Byrne did it with that, you know, I wish I had the ear so I could talk through and do a crit. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll look for it and do it like a session uh, on it. Um, like a special just additional session that I do in the middle of the week or something. Um, but John Byrne just did a comic book where it was just 22 panels. He just drew them as splash pages. Uh, yeah, I saw that. I saw I saw Maz is uh, excited on, on uh, Dune Beer's uh, last day. Um, I am. I hope. I hope uh, Dune Beer gets to continue doing the artist editions. I don't know if uh, IDW is going to assume that they get to continue without him. I mean. It's 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 a sad day that we're uh, the man who spearheaded the whole thing is now gone from the company that was doing them. But I'm very very excited that uh, to see his Batman Year One Artist Edition. And I also like that um, I I have a hard time thinking that someone's not going to immediately step up and say. Um, we're going to back you. I mean, I would love it if it was Image. So I think Image has has the funds to get him to do it. And then imagine you you would you would have access to. I mean, right now a lot of the artist editions are Marvel DC, almost exclusively with reprints of classic EC and other other classics. I would love to see an artist edition of the first six issues of Walking Dead, because I thought that was some of, um, oh God, I'm blanking on his name right now. So about to, I was just about to say it. Um, I'd love to see an artist edition of Walking Dead. I'd love to see uh, an artist. They've done some of those oversized um, card stock covered um, uh, editions. Uh, and I bought one. I'm trying to remember the name of it. Been a long time. It's on the shelf in the, my living room. I'm not going to run out and get it because I spent too much time talking about books already. But I, 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 I have to think that there's certain artist editions from the early image era, era like some early Travis Charest, like the Travis Charest Wildcats. I'd love to see artist editions of that um, just because the work was so amazing. Um, but I'd also still like to see some, like I'd love to see an artist edition of Jose Luis Garcia Lopez's uh, Twilight with, with Howard Chagan. Um, I, I, at one point, back when I was in art collecting, before I, I decided, I realized there's other people who um, present the work instead of just having it sit in a folder in their, in their studio. Um, so that's why I stopped collecting original art. Um, I had two or three pages of Garcia Lopez uh, Twilight Art. And they learned so much. Zombies and I don't dance. Um, but there's so many, um, so many great books that haven't been touched yet. I, I, I have to think that the artist editions are gonna continue in some way. And I think I think Scott's the man. I, I, I have a feeling that in letting them go, IDW doesn't get access to his personal files. So I have to think that, that Scott has a ton of art scanned for other books coming down. Imagine uh, artist edition of, oh, now, now, now that I started thinking about it, it's like I'm now lost for choice. Um, uh, SAG is all digital. I think, I think that's the one problem. A lot of more recent books are, are, are so significantly digital you'd have a hard time justifying an artist edition of those. But any of the classic pen and ink pieces, like any of Silvestri's uh, later works, some of Sylvester, Sylvester was the guy I followed the image more than anyone else. I like Jim Lee, um, but Sylvester was the guy. Um, 
But also, if he, if he if he goes to image, it means that other independent books could also um, get in there too. I think IDW might have seen. I mean, you had Hellboy, so you, you had Dark Horse um, uh, in the mix. I don't think Dark uh, Dark Horse would ever say no to more Mignola artist editions. Um, so I think I think. There's a new hardcover of the Corbin um, Hellboy stuff coming out, especially with, since the, the new Hellboy movie is going to be based on the stories that you originated. Um, but imagine artist edition of all the Hellboy, Co Corbin Hellboy work. That would be amazing. I would, I'd buy that in a heartbeat. Then you can do artist editions of like Corbin's black and white work from Marvel, because I'm sure Marvel would uh, be happy to see. Because most of that stuff was like Edgar Allan Poe and or is that Dark Horse too? Shit. My gosh, my memory's going bad. I just saw um, I just saw Knox Goes Away, the new Michael Keaton um, directed um, crime movie. Uh, he, he, he plays a hitman who gets diagnosed with uh, uh, Kreutzfeldt Jakob's disease, and it's a really aggressive version. So he's um, losing his memory and cognition at a very rapid rate, and he wants to set things right. Uh, I'll simplify. He wants to set things right with his son before he's, it's too late, and things don't go as as he hopes. Of course, because otherwise you wouldn't have a movie. But um, so whenever whenever since I watched it like three, four days ago, every time I kind of go, what was I going to say again? I go, uh-oh. So, so that right after the movie, I mean, it looked up Crunch with Jacobs. I've heard of it before, but never really read on it. And it can start hitting guys in their 50s. And I'm like, oh, I'm 56, dudes. Uh-oh. <laughs> So I'm, I'm doing like a graded, lots of lines here on this band, knowing I'm going to go with the uh, the thicker, the, the, the zero three, uh, a little bit later to actually make it feel like it's more like leather and uh, metal studs. But I just want to get uh, some value down here. And some uh, some lights on that. Realize I wanted to do that before I do the next thing. Yeah, it's pretty good. Um, I'd seen. I think I think Keaton has directed two movies. I saw. The, I think the first one was called The Merry Gentleman. I may be misremembering that again. Here we are as we talk about memory going away. Uh, and it was okay. Um, it didn't make me go, "Oh my God, he's 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 just going to be this great director." This is this was to my memory, uh, significantly better than The Merry Gentleman. He's, uh, he was more confident in framing the shots. Uh, the action flowed better. Uh, maybe he worked with a different editor, so it, it, it came together in final form. It's not a great movie. It's not, it's not something like um, Dune 2 or LA Confidential, like one of the greats uh, in a genre. But it's, it's, actually, it's actually a good watchable little thriller. And um, so if you, you, you see it and you're at a loss or what else, you don't have anything you specifically want to watch, I recommend watching it. It's not a waste of time. Try to think, well, now that I said that not a waste of time, I feel I have to come up with an example of what's a waste of time. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> Not interested in, in being negative on anything right now. Um, oh, also, you know what? While I'm trying to be positive about things, Shogun, if you haven't been watching Shogun, is highly worth it. I am doing this thing where I am watching. Uh, I watched, I waited till about six episodes are out. And then I started watching them. So I, I was hearing really good word of mouth. And I don't like watching more than two or three at a time because then, then I start losing focus and stuff like that. And like really intense, but I can easily watch two episodes of great TV back to back. 
So I've been, I'm, I'm two episodes behind where they, I think they're on episode seven, just came out eight, it's coming out Tuesday. There's 10 episode run. So what I'm trying to do is watch everything except for episode nine. And then while episode 10 is broadcasting, I'm going to watch nine and then I can watch the finale right after. That's just how I, I go about doing this weird stuff. This is me. I'm a weirdo. Um, similarly, I'm going to wait for Sugar, the, the new Colin Farrell uh, series. I'm hearing really good things about the first episode or two. I think it's the first two episodes. And uh, I'm really excited. I think Colin Farrell's a horribly underrated, underappreciated actor. Uh, he's been in some bad movies, but he's he's always been good in them. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna watch Sugar. I'm trying to think what else. Um, is there anything else I'm holding off on watching? I can't recall. I think I think it's just Sugar, uh, Sugar, and, and Shogun. But Shogun is so good. I remember fondly as a kid watching the original Richard, Richard original, the Richard Chamberlain. Um, yes, yes, uh, Ripley. I've heard, and I think it's it's since it's Netflix. I think it might be all the episodes are available now. Um, I like the lead actor. I liked him ever since I saw him in Sherlock. Um, so I'm I'm very interested in trying that out. Oh, my throat's so dry. Um, yeah, I'm going to give her a little nose stud here, right there. So it'll balance up, uh, giving her uh, real, real dark black lips. He gave oh Macbeth. Okay, I'm I'm a I'm a soft touch for Macbeth. Oh, that sounds really. Did you is, was that broadcast or did he do that in stage? Again, referring to Macbeth uh, being set in an asylum. At one point, I was, oh, oh geez, so, so damn it, I'll never be able to watch it. At one point, I wanted to do a post-apocalyptic Macbeth as a comic book. I think that works. I think, I think that works for a face. Yeah, some some great stage presentations end up getting like shot, um, not brilliantly. I mean, you can't really direct um, uh, film stage play that effectively. Um, I've, I've seen some brilliant versions uh, uh, over time that that were weren't shot for film, like for theatrical release, but just shot for um, having a record of the performances. So I get that. So hopefully that's happening. I, and honestly, if I'm watching, I saw a version of Doubt like that. I really like the Doubt movie. And I'm hearing really, really good things about the Liev Schreiber uh, version currently shown in New York. I'm actually tempted to, to make a trip down to New York just to watch it. Uh, so I, I do like my theater. It's going to have the jacket flare, but I think it's just going to fold behind there. Yeah, it's long enough that it would just fold. I, you know, honestly, as long as it looks like a Loro, a Roro, a, 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 a Roro, wow. You know when you say a word and you know you're saying it right, but it sounds wrong in your head? 
Aurora. I'm having that. I'm having that. I know there's a term for it too. Um, yeah, I think this is the woman without superpowers. You could lead the X-Men right here. That's, that's, that's the type of drawing I'm going for here. Let's get like a seam here. Saw a little break in the line. I figured that'd be a good point to put a seam in the jacket. I put one over here. Just a hint of it, even though we won't see it. What's going on with my point three or zero three? So I can just heavy up. I'm trying to remember, was, was Aurora? I'm, I'm just going to have that for a while now. Um, Krakoa almost done. I, um, okay, so I liked the first arc Hickman did. But while I was reading it, I was thinking as someone who might have to, not that I was, asked or anything but i was thinking about any of the other writers who'd have to come in and deal with all the stuff that hickman was doing with the x-men and it went that was a bad call um essentially making the uh the x-men uh, practically immortal um I, th I think it's a bad call for any any uh franchise um it just it limits your ability to tell certain stories but um, I'm off camera at this point, aren't I? Yeah. Let me uh, pull this down a bit. Yeah. I mean, um, it was an interesting idea, an interesting idea space to explore, um, like an Elseworlds. Uh, I still, I still, I'm happy that DC is bringing Elseworlds back. Elseworlds is one of the things, like, if DC says, uh, we want you to draw an Elseworlds, I'll say yes, because you're allowed to do interesting things. Uh, I think the last time I was asked to do something by DC, I had to say no, because the editor's not even there anymore, uh, because it would have been so overseen by editorial to be essentially creatively dead to my mind. Um, it felt like Hickman's run was a brilliant Elseworlds uh, take on, on the X-Men. Like, let's go over here and then have it end somehow. Um, there's been a lot of interesting things with the X-Men since they stopped being like a regular comics reader. I think the last thing, like, yeah, I think the last Marvel thing I picked up with any consistency um, and this is even over Conan, which I only really started getting into when Jim took over, um, was Hickman's, Hickman's uh, X-Men run. Um, I mean, I'll buy uh, books of my friends drop Marvel uh, out of loyalty to my friends, but I'm not necessarily reading them. That sounds terrible. Hope it doesn't sound terrible. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of picky what I spend my time reading. Uh there's not a lot of comics I really, really uh, get thrilled by anymore because normally, especially corporate comics, and that's that feels kind of a derogatory statement, but it's intended as such. Um, I find corporate comics are, are terribly boring. What is the ice cream or assholes? I like that. Um, I think they already established that every one of the X-Men at some point can be a villain and every X-Men villain can eventually be a hero because they're just swapping them out on like a, a merry-go-round. 
And it's like, oh, are you dead? No, I'm a villain this month. All right, okay, next week you're going to be a good guy. Yes, next week I'm going to be a good guy again. And that's, um, to my mind, a big problem uh, that creates that is when they start releasing multiple books a month. From a commercial standpoint, I understand why they do it. There are certain comic fans who are only Batman fans. And if you do six monthly Batman books, they buy all six monthly Batman books. But they were never going to buy any other DC titles either, anyway. And um, it doesn't mean I like it. I, I think for the longest time, there was Batman and Detective Comics and World's Finest. So you had three doses, well, Justice League too, but three doses of ostensibly Batman books. Although one of them was a team up with Superman. And that's or I already felt that was too much. But Detective had the angle, it was it was when it was done well, it had more of a crime investigative aspect. Batman were more adventures in the DC universe with our super our superhero. Uh World's Finest was always the team up book. How can we get Superman and Batman to work together again? Uh which I thought always thought was kind of like an interesting creative idea. Um, because I mean night and day in terms of how they approach stuff. Um, and there were some like some really, really, I, I, I think I preferred World's Finest when it was like Superman teaming up with someone else or if they did things, there was that relaunch that lasted a little while where they had like a really good episode where it was Etrigan and Aquaman teaming up against Lovecraftian monsters. Um, I think my, all, my all-time favorite World's Finest, I think this is World's Finest, was Superman and Swamp Thing. Uh, jung the Jungle Line, where um, Superman picks up an alien uh, infection, uh, and he's, he knows he's losing control, and he doesn't think anyone can stop him, so he, he flees to the swamp, where Swamp Thing runs into him and um, saves him. But Superman can't remember anything, so he doesn't know that uh, Swamp Thing saved him. So that was one of my favorite. Uh, Alan Moore wrote that. Rick Veitch. Um, Rick Veitch drew it. I, I'm not sure if he inked it. Hey, JC, how you doing? I think Detective also was the one that had a backup story. I think Green Lantern for a long, long time. I'm thinking, thinking back to when I was like reading monthlies and just getting into comics at the time. I think at the time, Detective had a Batman lead story that was about 12 to 16 pages and then an eight page, usually Green Arrow story because Green Arrow didn't have a book at that time. And I thought that was that was a perfectly fine use of Detective. Um But when the, in the, I mean, when you have, I think, I think right, right now, you had spilling out of the Hickman X Men launch. You had a relaunch of Excalibur. You had two X Men, like X Men Gold and Blue. I don't know what they ended up calling them during the thing. You always have Wolverine. Um, I think did X Factor come back in some way, or X Force come back in some way? So you had something like four to six X Men related books creating their own universe within the Marvel universe, um, and you have to come up with stories every single month. You're going to eat up through so much idea space, and invariably you're going to end up with idea space that that could be explored in a really really interesting way, but may get be may get handled by the wrong person to tell that story. Um, yeah, okay, it's kind of like out there. So I think the hands working all right. Might go back in and like just do little little highlights of white paint on the leather gloves.
Yeah, it felt like, especially with the crossovers, the, the non X Men books. Um, I just, I really feel that. God, my fingernails are filthy. Um, I usually clean them every day. I, I didn't do it today. It's, it's, you know, maintain some certain certain level of specialness to your characters by uh, exposing them less. I, I think. I love one of the things I loved about what ifs when DC was doing them is uh, up until it basically became a new uh, what if Batman was this stupid thing. Um, and I'm talking about someone who actually, you know, um, worked on that uh, on Elseworlds. I don't think I like the belt going as far as I sketched it there. Um, I think the what ifs or the Elseworlds allow you to tell stories with these characters in a way that doesn't overexpose them and it does so in an in a interesting way where you take a story that either you never could be told like you know x-men set in the 1950s um or what if what if the x-men are all black and the story was set in the south um during the antebellum south okay what if what if that was x-men Piss off all the uh, the, the, sn- uh, the right wing snowflakes with that. Um, those are different enough that they don't eat up the idea space of your main X Men line, your monthly X Men line, which is essentially your bread and butter as far as Marvel Comics go. Um, I think the overuse and overexposure of your characters is is a is a dangerous thing. So yeah, I, I, I understand the the sheer desperation uh, Marvel has since it's a publicly traded company. Um, but I think editorial should have fought harder against publishing everything they could. They can make a dollar. Well, I'm drawing way off camera here. Sorry, I just I followed the line down the figure. How are we doing? Oh, we're 10 after 8. I think I'm going to go till about uh, 8.30. So it'll be another 90-minute uh, uh, stream. I think that seems to be the comfortable number I've been, been hitting for a while. Let me uh, definitely finish the top here. Um, and depending on how much time left, I'll dig into... Uh, the lightning effect coming off from her hand here into the black space. This will be a lot of a white paint effect and other stuff. Um, that's that's. I, I know I'm going to be doing white paint and other special effects. Something I don't mind my printing on a solid area of black because um, I know I'm going to be doing things that's having fun with it. I'm also curious. I wonder if I should do um, a tone. To really establish that she's she's black with white hair, I could do my rubber stamp to actually give her a darker uh, skin tone for her midriff and her arms and her head. Um, I think about that because I'd be really really careful to be really careful with uh, how I do that. No, I'm not going to put any holes around breast level. Uh, I was, I was thinking it's like that would be, that'd be a little Frank Cho, <laughs> like uh, over sexualizing characters that uh, don't need it. Hey, Zach. In fact, you know what? I drew a five-page story. You know what? That's a great reminder. I did talk to Dennis. I uh, uh, We talked about it. Uh, he had a whole bunch of these micro short stories. And um, I, this is this is just before the Coven uh, launched. I, 
you know what? It was also around the time I got I got banned from Twitter, and that's where we're doing most of our communication. Thanks for the reminder for that, because then I'm going to reach out. I'm going to reach out to Dennis because I have completely forgot about that. I drew this five page story. I think I I don't think I lettered it. I think I I just drew it, and I was waiting for approval on that. And then life just got stupidly busy. Zach, thank you so much for that reminder, because that's like that's that's a project I really was excited about. Uh, the idea was for me to adapt. They were going to do a Kickstarter and have me adapt a whole pile of these these brilliant little Delta Green short stories. And the first one was really fun. I, I got to the. I don't want. I don't want to spoil anything. Uh, but there's a weird like alien dog that it shows it for one panel. Uh, it's. Um, God, what's the name of the? Uh, they published two books that are almost like Delta Green anecdotes. Um, and if you know Delta Green, you know that you know <laughs> the anecdotes from Delta Green are going to be nightmarish. And um, so they're all like you know what happened after a mission. Um, this mission go went really, really, really bad. Um, and uh, this one is two agents driving to get rid of a body. And we're deep in the thoughts of like one of the agents who's thinking about what he's doing for a living here. And if you play it, Delta Green, for people who, who don't know what Delta Green, uh, Delta Green is this brilliant contemporary Call of Cthulhu inspired role playing game. And the, the idea is, is that if you're Delta Green is a secret former government organization that has known about the Lovecraftian menace, using that term, uh, Cthulhu menace or the uh, elder menace since uh, the events of uh, Shadow of Rainsmouth. Um, and so the government's been actively working against these alien powers Problem is, these alien powers are alien powers, and many of them are immortal. Uh, they use magic and technology that just completely overwhelms everything we can do. Um, and it's it was just a brilliant, brilliant role playing game. It's still out there. It's still out there. And I was a huge fan. Uh, I think Dennis Detweiler developed it with John Tynes. Um, he's, a, he's also a, a really good writer. Um, this is great. Okay, this is great. So I'll see. I think I scanned it. So maybe I'll, I'm, I'm sure I got his email too. So I should be able to start this out this week, if not uh, next week. I mean, let me do a post it. Let me do a post it. Yeah. Um, my God, I think they actually gave me an advance for the story too. Shoot, I'm gonna have to. Yeah, yeah, that's a great reminder because it's great. I, I'm getting through like a really stupidly busy phase right now, and I was just starting to focus on just the witch book, but I think I can easily do um, the stuff for October as well as the Delta Green stuff at the same time. So if he wants more stories, I can get on, or he might just want to launch a Kickstarter with the one story. But all I have left to do for that is if he approves the inks is lighter and color it. Yeah, I love me some more. Yeah, uh, Delta Green is a tabletop RPG. Um, and I think the inspiration I think was largely from like, well, let's what 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 if Cthulhu was uh, Call of Cthulhu was a uh, contemporary role-playing game instead of one set in the 1920s. And they did a lot of... So their game books on their own were worth reading. Uh, just just brilliant ideas in both uh, The Adventures, which I never got to play through or run as a game master. Um, How's that working? I'm trying to make that t-shirt look like it's kind of shredded up a bit, like, like it's worn out and everything. So allow me to do highlights. Yeah, Delta Green's cool. 
If you're into horror role playing, uh, get yourself Delta Green. I think it's still in print. It's uh, from the Tynes Cowan Corporation, I believe. I also did, uh, in fact, um, I showed that Elric book that came out of that game box. I have my comps of all the work I did for, um, was it Ars Magica? No, a uh, different game. Um, John Tynes and Dennis Detweiler came up with another horror role playing game, but it was a Lovecraftian. It was, it, it felt a lot more like um, Clive Barker's approach to magic. Um, and the players were, one of, one of the titles was great, it was a Lawyers, Guns, and, and Money. It was, it was just like how fucked up the world would be if magic was real. I love, I love that game. So I did a bunch of illustrations for that. Uh, one cover that I wanted to do more. Yeah, I don't know. I, I probably would have ended up cleaning my studio at some point and come across. It was just five pages. I think it was just five pages. Fun stuff, man. Really scary stuff. So I hope, yeah, this is good. That's, that's great. It's, um, just gonna make sure I'm on camera here. Let me do another piercing. Enable. Yeah, I think I'm going to do the, uh, the rubber stamp on this. On your skin tones. I think that'll look really nice. That, that nice graphic element opposite this big block there to the side would uh, will, will work nicely, I think. Can we put highlights in those fingernails too, because that's, that's kind of lost there. Should be cool if I could just pick up on uh, the Delta Green stuff with. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for scripts for Second Coming for more layouts, and I got covers to do for that. I get to do a cover for the uh, the Babs book that uh, Garth Ennis and uh, the guy used to do uh, cross stuff for um, Avatar Comics. They're doing a book for Ahoy, and I'm doing an alternate cover for that. So that's going to be really fun. Camera. So, but um, be good to have something outside of stuff that I'm self-generating, ready, ready to work on. So, thank you so much for that reminder, because I had completely forgot about doing working on that. I've actually done some work for a Pathfinder too. Um, they, uh, they did an uh, adventure arc and I did these full page, hang on, I might have, ooh, I might have to Delta Green stuff in the same spot as these pages or not. One second, just one second. That's covered, it's covered. No, 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 that's not it. That's not it, that's a cover too, that's not it. You know, that's a horrible dusty or comic. 
Oh, just give me one more second to see if it just turns up. Oh, that's my Sasquatch cover. Come. Huh. Nope. Okay, I'm not finding it. But for Pathfinder, they did an adventure arc. That was, I think it was six books total. And I did these um, one-page um, newspaper sheets. They're fully illustrated, like in the old uh, one-page singles. Um, and it was really, really, really fun to do that. And Eric and I had talked about my doing a Pathfinder relevant Jack trick, Jack chick tract. Um, and that was, I think it was initially intended for this year. And then I probably would have used it as an excuse to go to Gen Con. Um, but they've just, uh, the person who would have been handling all the work for that, um, I think is working somewhere else now. So the person who would have been the, uh, I guess, development lead on that is not there. So I don't think it's happening this year. But I do like me, uh, Eric Mona and I go back. And I'm, I'm doing work for role-playing games goes back to, in fact, you know what? Okay, I'm going to go grab something from that box. I couldn't show you the other pages. But I, can, I can get something out of that box. So this is a little bit of role-playing game history involved in this. Now, I think if, if anyone is really involved in, in role-playing games, they know that TSR went bankrupt at one point, which stopped new Advanced Dungeons & Dragons material coming out. And uh, then uh, Wizards of the Coast bought them. And um, they're, they're, they're developing a new rule set. Um, they also came up with something called the D20 um srd and uh the idea behind that is the core books sold great uh the dnd core books player's handbook monster manuals dungeon master head those books all the monster manuals other characters books they sold great adventures sold okay see with the other books Everyone would want them. The players would want the DMG and the Monster Manual so they can they can know how the game runs better. But the adventures sold a fraction, because there's always people who who you know the DM. The only one person buying the adventure, and that's the DM. Um, and a lot of people would never buy adventures; they make their own. <clears throat> but they sold well enough that a smaller company could make a decent profit off of an adventure. So Ryan Dancy came up with the idea for the SRD. It was a all the intellectual property um, that belonged to now Wizards of the Coast was stripped out, and it was just rules and spells and and core monsters and stuff like that. And they released it, so a whole bunch of publishers in a rush tried to have material ready for the first Gen Con with the new edition, uh, third edition of Dungeons and Dragons coming out. And I got reached out to by a company called Atlas Games. So they were they wanted um, to put out a book for Gen Con. So it was super rushed. So I had to do this painting um, for the cover. And there's like they were wearing camo paint. Uh, and it was like a secret mission John, written by John Tyne to uh, help create, it, create uh, Delta Green. And this is an acrylic painting done long. I may, I don't know if I have it anymore. I might. So I did this really quickly. Uh, and yeah, I, I had the idea with like, you know, overgrown stones and the idea that he was just emerging out of that and like little red flowers to imply all the blood that would splatter and try to make him look like a special forces fantasy guy. And, and this is like 2000, I think, uh, before I started doing my, my uh, Frank Frazetta signature is a little, this kind of signature I was doing before. And so I was one of the first um, artists to do anything for D&D outside of uh, Wizards of the Coast. It was the third edition. Uh, and I believe, 
trying to remember. Oh, yeah, here we go. It was a limited edition, 344 or 500. This is my one comp they sent me. It was like, what? You know, they should have sent me like the second or third one. Uh, John Tynes, nephew. Reeves, Torin Atkinson, that's right. Torin Atkinson, who, uh, Darkest of the Hillside Thickets, he's like a Lovecrafting rock group. Uh, yeah, so this was, um, this is a fun little, little bit of nostalgia to find in that box. Um, yeah, and here we go. Again. Requires uh, the use of Dungeon Dragons Player's Handbook, third edition, published by Wizards of the Coast. And because I think they were just using the Player's Handbook as the main rules base, I don't think there was much in the way of like monsters. It's just, it was like you're fighting other humans, I think. I never actually got to play it. I've heard good things about it. And it's got like cool little bits. But yeah, so that's, uh, God, this is like 24 years old. Let me double check. Am I remembering that correctly? So this would be checked in Disha again. What, what year is here? 2000. This is 24 years old, man. 24 years old. God, I'm old. I think I'm a lot better painter now than I was then, too. <laughs> I should have done this in oils. It looks so dark there, too. It's, it's, well, at least it looks that dark on my, my screen. Oh, my God, it's 8.30. Um, all right, so I got a good start on, on Rogue here. I'm going to finish the Hellboy. Where did I put it? Here we go. I'll finish this Hellboy. And this um, from last week and the rogue this week, um, and it was a close choice, close close call between drawing um, Punk Storm or Savage Land Rogue, which I've never drawn before. So I have to think that next Sunday I'm going to draw Savage Land Rogue. Uh, so that means there's going to be you know dinosaur stuff and jungle and sexy barely clothed rogue so that'll be fun so yeah so i'll have these two done this week um along with all the other stuff i got i got a Fred, frizetta homage to do for uh the babs book which is going to be really fun all right guys um so that was fun i ended up talking about other stuff a little bit more than i intended but i think i got a good start in that storm i got all the hard parts of that storm piece done um, I will see you next week at seven and it'll be Savage Land, uh, Rogue. Uh, I think, I think there's enough, uh, there was a close enough call people messaging me which one to do and, and, and Storm just won, just barely went out. Um, so I'll get two X-Men out of my system and, uh, yeah, so you guys have an amazing week. Uh, if you like, you can support my $1 a month, uh, Patreon. Uh, you can see development work, stuff behind the scenes, uh, stuff that I can't share anywhere else for who knows how long. Uh, it's just $1 a month and you got access to all sorts of stuff. Um, on Instagram, Richard underscore Pace. You can, you can see, you know, all my stuff, stuff there. I'm on Blue Sky, I believe. I believe I'm Richard Pace on Blue Sky. Um, and again, if you have any questions or things you want me to do, Feel free to leave comments, um, and I, I'm pretty good at responding to that stuff. And, yeah, so you guys, you have a great night, great week, and I hope to see all of you next Sunday. Night, people.